Welcome to Bridging Chicago, a podcast that aims to connect our listeners to Chicago's business, community, cultural, and charity leaders. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Bridging Chicago podcast. I'm Nathan Shula, your host for today's episode, and I'm here with Patricia Moda, who is the CEO of ASE, the Hispanic Alliance for Career Enhancement, Mm -hmm. which has been around for 30 years. 40. 40 years. Yes. Yes. Since 1982. Which is long before you were with it. So (laughs) you are now leading this organization Mm -hmm. that has quite a history, Mm -hmm. quite a a background. Mm -hmm. Um, And I definitely want to talk about that. Uh, We are bridging Chicago, so we do love to talk about um, your Chicago link. So Mm -hmm. to kick us off, why don't you share with us if you were born here or you moved here from somewhere else or what's your Chicago tie here? Yeah, absolutely. I was born and raised in uh, East Chicago, Indiana. Okay. So it borders a southeast side of Chicago. Uh, So predominantly spent my time there. Um, my first, you know, growing up, we would come to Chicago every so often because it was close enough, right? Either yeah. taking the South Shore or come out because we've got family on the Southeast side, South side okay. of Chicago. Uh, but formally moving here to Chicago was when I uh, got my opportunity at ASE mm. in 2010. I was working in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana at the time. Okay. And got an opportunity for a program director role at ASE. Wow. And I was uh, earning my graduate degree in public administration and knew that I wanted to work at a nonprofit that I could build and scale programs. And so that was a perfect fit at the time. Been with ASE ever since, uh, where, you know, was able to build and scale programs and evolve to leading more of our fundraising um, partnerships across the nation and now serving as president and CEO uh, but my, this is my home, Chicago yeah. now, uh, but it really became my home because of ASE and yeah. the network that I was able to create, the relationships and the family here in Chicago, being that this is our headquarters yeah. um, as a result of ASE. I, you know, hit the ground running in terms of building networks and relationships for the organization. Um, but this is home. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so amazing. Um, I love when people... Um, come here from somewhere else and really connect with the city and its people. Um, When you first moved here, what did you know about Chicago or what did you hear about Chicago? And then maybe what surprised you about it once you did come here and you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that or that's different than what I saw on TV or heard on the news or whatever. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I think growing up, uh, my community, what I was familiar with was a predominantly black and Mexican neighborhood, oh, right? Cool. So yeah. that's what East Chicago predominantly was at the time. Uh, and so when I moved to Chicago, Uh, I think one of the things that was surprising was also knowing how, not only how diverse, like that I I was expecting, but how uh, the communities, right, in the neighborhoods in terms of being so segregated, right? So that's something I learned about over time. But then also I would say, you know, experience in in my upbringing because uh, I had an experience, like when I went to non-diverse communities in the sense my first predominantly white experiences Mm -hmm. it was a culture shock Mm -hmm. but then also helped me embrace the moments where there was so much diversity together and embrace and we do have those neighborhoods like you know Rogers Park and things but I think that there's so much richness about Chicago and being that I'm in a role that I've gotten the opportunity to travel to so many spaces We've got the greatest restaurants, the greatest food. I don't disagree. (laughs) And having been that I lived in other cities, I think that Chicago was the most welcoming and supportive from the beginning versus, um, you know, I think some other professional networks, they've been there over time. I had the opportunity to live in Houston and in Phoenix and Indianapolis. And I didn't feel that as much as I have in Chicago. And I think that makes us very special. It it is truly a big midwestern city um and i think growing up in the midwest you you get a different vibe you get a different sense of of who you are in relation to who's around you and i think um you feel that in pockets here in chicago you mentioned the diversity you know there's there's the two kinds of diversity here the the kind that is segregated within the Mm -hmm. communities but then you have neighborhoods like you mentioned rogers parker or albany park yeah where it's super diverse, yeah. you can hear, 
you know, 20, 30 languages spoken in those neighborhoods if you walk around. I think that really provides a unique perspective for people. But but the lesson there really is you got to walk around, yeah. right? right? Yeah. You got to get out there and go Absolutely. to these places. Absolutely. I think that's the richness of Chicago is being yeah. able to have that, right? Yeah. I think being that I, in the role that I serve and in interacting with a lot of leaders, influencers, corporate spaces, uh, for a place like Chicago, there's still a need for growth and opportunity to make sure there is representation mm-hmm. in positions of power and influence. And that's something that I get to lead with every day in my role because you would think of Chicago um, and, and, and a lot of cities that do have a, a diversity that there would be more diverse representation in those positions yeah. and we still have a long ways to go yeah yeah and that's what we're finding in um the, these conversations especially that we've been having this year mm-hmm. um where we talk to people who are either people of color or working in communities of color yeah. you know really trying to uh, enhance resources in yeah. these communities and we hear about, we really hear a lot about what people are doing for themselves mm-hmm. in their own communities. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really cool because a lot of times we think, mm-hmm. oh, we need to bring resources to the South side. We need to bring mm-hmm. resources to the West side. And while I do think we need to make resources available and known, mm-hmm. it's also about like already celebrating what's there yeah. and getting that out there versus like, you know, the, the narrative about these communities in these neighborhoods mm-hmm. is not always very good mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah no i i think uh look i my experience is uh that really has has taken me to where i am today part of my experience because we you know it's we all have our own unique experiences that shape yeah. us to become who we are and who we continuously become um as a journey is growing up in a predominantly um low income, you know, black and brown community. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had an experience as going into my junior year of high school where I moved to, uh, and because I have an older brother, uh, 10 years older than I am, who uh, married, uh, moved for a job to go outside uh, to Gilbert, Arizona. So right outside of Phoenix. Okay. Predominantly Caucasian affluent yeah. community. Yeah, that's where the um, the stadium is, I think, right? Well, Glendale. That's Glendale. Glendale, so right. Gilbert, okay. Arizona. Okay. That's yes. a little bit further out. But they're all uh, kind of in the yeah, Phoenix area. Yeah, so it's like a suburb, right? Okay. I think. And uh, I went to this high school. Uh, you know, my brother was able to convince my, my father, to, you know, Mexican traditional strict father, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say hey let's have her go to high school here and i did right but first thing was culture shock right because yeah. it's predominantly caucasian yeah. but i think for me at that age is like you make friends whatever right uh but the thing that was eye-opening and shocking was i was placed into ap classes taught by arizona state professors like physics calc so the academic rigor compared to where i was coming mm. from and i was a straight a student like a great grades with a different that was emphasized in my household. Yeah. The academic rigor was on a different level. Yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate to have a brother who could tutor me and, and help me, you know, get up to speed. So, but that was a shocking experience. The second thing was my original high school. We had um, recruiters from from the army, from the community college, mm-hmm. versus my new high school. They were like these universities and colleges from all over oh. recruiting us. Um, and and that's there's nothing wrong with the military community colleges, but that's what was being presented to us right yeah yeah. um and then you know the other thing that was shocking was that i was meeting with my guidance counselor often and we were like diligently working on a college career plan i didn't maybe realize it so much at the moment but something that it was shocking enough for i was trying to call my peers back home like hey this is what you got to do like uh but that's what happens in a lot of our underserved um under-resourced communities they may be black and brown. They may be other community groups, right, that are underrepresented. But the need that, depending on what area, you know, what zip code you're growing up in, is, it depends then what's afforded to you, yeah. right? So, and then that impacts your trajectory. So I, I say that was one of my first key eye-opening experiences that made me become an advocate for access and equity in everything that I do, meaning how am I advocating for others, whether I'm reaching out to them personally, whether I'm making sure, but then making sure that we're meeting individuals, meeting communities where they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And something to what you said earlier is like, how do we leverage? What do we have here? What talent, what expertise so that we can ensure that we're helping you thrive um, as an individual and helping you connect with whatever success means to you. Um, along the way. And so I, I think that, 
you know, there's so much richness in what Chicago has. And, yeah. and I think that we have amazing leaders that do represent a lot of these backgrounds, a lot of similar stories, right, that are making change along the way. What you said there mm-hmm. to me, when I read the mission or, or you know, study the mission of ASE, mm-hmm. I mean, it's what it is, right? Yeah. The, the one, one word that stuck out to me when I was reading it was meaningful. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, providing opportunities is great. Providing meaningful opportunities, yeah. I think, is different. Yeah, absolutely. And can you share with us how that's different and why? Um, and, and maybe that was done before you were there, mm-hmm. but but why the word meaningful might be important to ASE and to its mm-hmm. its uh, mission? Yeah, so many ways. I think it's it's like a thousand more important meaningful today than it ever has been. I think we work with a lot of place uh, folks that are in their careers um, and that we're hearing more than ever. It's like, I'm seeking purpose. I'm seeking meaning. I want to make a difference. And um, our values have shifted as a result of the pandemic, as a result of so much loss and and layoffs and just so many transitions that have happened that, you know, while that's been a part of us as mission since the very beginning, it's like, that much more important today right especially um communities of of color women that that the you know have been the gap has widened even further in terms of pay in terms of like building wealth and all of that and so uh the way that we've been able to do that is when asa started as an organization in 1982 our founders were working for corporations headquartered here in illinois and we're they were hearing then what you still hear today right like we're the latinos to work for our organization Right. So they started us as, as a way to connect employers to to their network of Latino professionals to helping build the, t- the pipeline of talent through student efforts and things. And so we still do that today. Um, but when I came in, the, the priority was how do we uh, build a meaningful pipeline of talent and, and support network to help individuals get to that next level? And again, uh, find success for what that is for them, however they define that understanding the responsibility that we have to pay it forward. And so what that looks like is through our uh, pipeline and leadership development programs, cohort model trainings that we've built that start as young at the high school level to now executive level that include individual uh, leadership assessments, um, coaching, mentoring. Um, But what I'm most proud of, and I think that is key, is the culturally relevant content Mm -hmm. That's meeting individuals where they are as it pertains to helping them, because part of being an effective leader, effective influence is being comfortable with who you are. And not all trainings out there is is focused on that. Right. So we're focused on what does it mean growing up with your own personal experience as it pertains to being an influencer, as it pertains to be a leader? What does it mean to growing up um, traditionally speaking? Because it doesn't mean for everything. But if you grew up in a traditional Latino household um, to be a humble leader, to lead with modesty to lead with humility to lead with putting your family first never changing that never assimilating into your environments that you believe who you think you're supposed to be but really embracing who you are so that you become that effective leader and influencer within your own groups and that is changing you know you have folks going back into their spaces like whole new level of confidence and yeah. and leadership where you have employers asking like what did you do to them like in a good way <laughs> Because they know that they're part of something special and yeah. that they know that they can now lean into their own identity yeah. in a special way so that they're influencing. So I'm most proud of the multi-generational support mm-hmm. network that we've been able to create as a result where we have successful executives, senior leaders, subject matter experts coming back as trainers, guest speakers, mentors, coaches, and those in their careers doing the same for our students where they know they have a lifelong network. Um, familia, we call it Ace Familia, that they continuously tap into and ask questions because that's one thing that I found is that um, that's a beautiful value that we do have is that humility piece, but it also hinders our progress when we're not asking for what we deserve as it pertains to pay. Yeah. When we're not tooting our own horns and we need to do it. And, you know, I've fallen into this, but something that I've gotten better with practice over time yeah. <laughs> that you get more comfortable with it. But, you know, people, even from our, the, especially young women, they're like, how do you go up there and just like, you know, give the speech or do I was like, I'm still nervous. Yeah. I still get, yeah. and they're like, Oh really? Like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you just got to put yourself out there. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think part of the meaningful part that, that we're helping folks figure out and really embrace through awesome. Um, you mentioned in there about P 
people feeling comfortable in their own skin, mm -hmm. you know, being happy with who they are. Yeah. I don't even know if happy is the right word yeah. because, you know, how do you judge, how do you test that? But yeah. um, I, th I think that one of the, the early ways to kind of kickstart that is people seeing people who look like them yeah. and sound like them out in the world yeah. or, you know, on TV or, you know, writing books and all these mm -hmm. things. And, and we've had the distinct pleasure so far this year of interviewing some amazing Latina and Latino leaders, authors, you know, mm. people who are doing big things. Mm -hmm. um, but those people doing those big things don't always get the platforms that other people mm -hmm. get. Um, can you speak to why it's important for people to be able to see people like them doing these things and sort of how that might set them up for success or how that might kind of help them get into your program and, and yeah. gain that more confidence? I, I think whenever you hear, no matter what background they have, any leader, influencer, um, in any sector, you always, there's always a story there where they were able to envision mm. themselves getting there. Mm. And part of that story of envisioning is uh, perhaps someone from a similar background, whether it's cultural, whether it's, it has to do with like socioeconomic status or whatever, which is why storytelling is so critical uh, and important. And then, you know, when you look at Latino executives and let's say in the corporate realm um, for the last decade, Senior level executives from Hispanic, Latinx, Latin A background is only 4% wow. and 1% Latinas. We're like nearly 20% of the U.S. population. And yeah. if you look at certain cities more than others, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so, and then we can go into different sectors. And 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 then we have, there's a study by the Center for Talent Innovation um, that surveyed a thousand Latino professionals and 76% of them were saying that they repressed some part of their persona in the workplace because they did not see themselves represented. 54% yeah. uh, Latinos say, that, they, that whatever executive presence was, that wasn't for them, that they didn't see themselves. So, yeah, it's important that you see more Latino yeah. uh, senior leaders sharing their stories and visible. I'm proud that we've also seen, because we're, we, we represent 27 countries of origin in terms of what Hispanic Latinos are in the U.S. Uh, some of us are first, second, third generation, other immigrants, yeah. right? Yeah. Not all of us speak Spanish. Some of us speak Spanglish, you know? <laughs> and um, so it's like, there's we're not a monolith. We're so diverse. And how do we, you know, educate and create that awareness and part of that is by making sure that Latinos are sharing their story and the other thing I will say is that we um, when we launched our Mujeres Asset program in, in Houston there was um, an oil and gas company and we asked them like who's your highest ranking you know Latino to come speak and, and share remarks with the group and um, there was a woman, she was like, yay, hi, like, I don't know, five fours, and, uh, you know, and, and blonde hair, blue eyes. She goes up to the podium. She starts sharing her story. She heads up the engineering department. Okay. Like, very powerful position. Yeah. She starts sharing about growing up. She went with, with her mom cleaning homes, like these very wow. nice homes, and that she was Mexican. And you saw the jaws drop of, of the other Latinas yeah, <laughs> yeah. that never knew for as long as they were working at this company that this woman was of Mexican descent and just the pride, right, yeah, that, yeah. that they had um, to be able to hear her story and, and the empowerment that happened yeah. as a result. And so, um, you know, hey, we've had folks that climbed through the ranks that they felt they had to be a certain way or hit some part of their persona that, that were able to do so. Um, we welcome you, too. If you haven't shared your Latinita story, we want to hear from you. Yeah. Um, because again, we're so diverse, but it's so critical. And like the research shows that um, it is hindering if you're not seeing that representation, progress and growth. Yeah. Um, Chicago seems to be a city that's very receptive to the mm -hmm. kind of work that you're doing mm -hmm. and to, to learning and then growing and to helping these populations of mm -hmm. people to grow. Um, what, what is your connection with the city as far as ASE and the city working together? Um, and I don't mean necessarily like city hall, but like, mm -hmm. you know, within these communities, how, how does that connection, how'd you build that connection? How do you help it grow? How do you foster that? Yeah, no, I connection? think, you know, there's a huge opportunity, you know, us is homegrown here. This mm -hmm. is our, our headquarters. This is where we have a lot, we've started a lot of our programs, all of our programs for that matter. Uh, and then, you know, we've scaled from here where we now have trainings in Houston and wow. in other cities like LA, New York, Miami, but then virtual, right? Because the last two years 
you kind of were, were forced to do that, where we then became global yeah. because we've got folks participating in our programs. I think, you know, with the city here and, and, and in general, there's a lot more opportunities. I, I ask this traditionally, we work with corporations, but I see our model working in other sectors and mm. in government. Um, there's there's uh, education and so many others that we can adopt our model that's been working well uh, for these other sectors to help. And, and we're customizing in the sense that we're taking what we've learned that works well to empower and to advance people to build accelerators, right? We're working with a cybersecurity firm and half of the cohort participants will be career changers. The other half will be um, entry level. And through this cohort accelerator, they're going to have a full-time cybersecurity role, six figures, which is life-changing. For yeah. someone. Talk about a meaningful career change. Yeah. Like yeah. So that we want to be able to do more with the city. We okay. want to be able to do um, more, you know, just in general with other sectors to be able to really help accelerate that. So I I think you know we're just scratching the surface yeah. um and and there's so much more opportunity who, who can um partner with ase who, who can join this program anyone and everyone <laughs> i so here's the thing i will say we, we we do have um that's local to chicago with the macarthur foundation okay um grant money that for if you are in nonprofit and education um government that are looking to participate in our any of our programs um through that foundation we have scholarship dollars right so mm -hmm. that anybody can be able to participate uh whether you're just getting started in your career whether you're a little more experienced uh, again we've got the whole pipeline if you're a student want to go through our university leadership program or your high school wow. or Futuro high school uh, all of those are being offered now virtually wow. as well um, but a great great network and an opportunity to have that safe space and those candid conversations to help you accelerate your career so what you're saying is people would be crazy not to want to be a part of this. And it's free. It's free. And then if you just want to be an individual member, it's free to sign up on our website. You go yeah. to assetonline.org. Um, the other cool thing, this is why I love podcasts. Four years ago when the pandemic started, we started weekly cafecito con Asse, weekly live stream, uh, 20 minute charla conversation where we have, it's either myself, I now have team members interviewing others, uh -huh. um, just having a conversation about how they got to where they are in their careers. Wow. Again, helping folks see themselves in various sectors, various yeah. roles, and represented across the nation. Yeah, we'll definitely have to check that out. What was yeah. the name of that? Cafecito con Ace. So it's like coffee with Ace. Wow. Yeah. And not everybody drinks coffee, we've learned. Yeah, I'm a right? tea drinker. But... So we're like, what's your morning <laughs> beverage of choice? <laughs> we've heard some interesting comments to that. Oh, I'm sure. I actually tried kombucha today and I was like, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. I tried that too. But we've got some tomato juice drinkers, one of our team members. We've got some Sprite drinkers in the morning. Hey, it's, hey, awesome. it's very diverse. You know, yeah. And, uh, just another layer of diversity. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I know that there's a, a national conference that ASA yes, is putting on that's yes. coming up here. Um, and so we want to make sure to let people know about it yeah. because it's really exciting. So. It is really exciting. I The last two years, this year included, is a hybrid. So if you don't happen to be in Chicago, but if you are in Chicago, no excuse, you must be there in person. Yeah. April 20th and 21st at the Renaissance Chicago. And it's a full two days of content for professionals from workshops talking about building your brand, effective networking, uh, how do you advocate for diversity, become more of an influencer, uh, and then great networking opportunities, but also content um, for uh, our other constituents, which are the recruiters, right? Mm -hmm. How talent acquisition folks, like how are you ensuring that you're building a diverse pipeline of talent for your organization? And then those in diversity, equity, and inclusion roles. Um, uh, and then the Friday evening is a, our annual celebration. So it's a gala this year, um, April 21st, get to have fun, get to have great music, entertainment, but also where we award folks that help really exemplify the, the Austin mission throughout the year. Uh, but also there's something else special. Our Women's Leadership Program, our Latina Leadership Program, Mujeres de Ace, uh, this year is celebrating 15 years. So we're calling it the Mujeres Hace Quinceañera on oh. that brunch, <laughs> that Friday. Um, you know, hey, chamelanes, we're doing the damas, padrinos, madrinos, wow, <laughs> all of yeah. the chats. It is a brunch, but we are recognizing a woman for each of the years, the 15 wow. years. Um, and so we are, if you will happen to be an alum from any of our programs, um, but Mujeres Hace specifically, we're accepting nominations uh, until March 14th for both the awards gala and then the Mujeres Hace Quinceañera. Yeah. 
That's so cool. Yeah. Um, I love the the theme, Asset United, accelerating yes. equity and action and account with action and accountability. Two really important pieces. Of that. Yes. I, you know, look, a lot has regressed since the pandemics of last year. And so when we talk about accelerating equity, we're talking about accelerating inclusion, accelerating, you know, belonging, a diversity. Yeah. So yeah. all of that with action and accountability. And what that means is what are the best practices out there that we need to make sure we're doubling down, we're tripling down yeah. um, and being creative about that? Because, yes, there's been budget cuts. Yes, there's been layoffs. But this is a priority. If we really want to see progress, not only in Chicago, but across America mm -hmm. and our economy, mm -hmm. right? You're mm -hmm. talking about Latino specifically, a 2.84 trillion GDP as terms of economic contributions. If uh, that were a community, if that were a country, that would be the fifth largest country wow. in terms of GDP. If we're not investing in this community, yeah. doubling down, accelerating, that's a loss for our economy. Not And the acceleration not only means doubling down on what's working best, it's saying, hey, accelerate pilot try new things because it is a uh, you know a priority to make sure that it investing not only in this community and in, in the black community you know aap the asian american pacific islander those that have been left behind is an imperative for our american yeah. society yeah if you're someone in a corporate setting in a leadership position wondering how to do meaningful DEI absolutely. work. Yeah. I mean, that seems yeah. like the place to be. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it, be there, uh, help us, you know, with your knowledge, your insights. And if you're just getting started and you want to know how to be a part of it, join us. Right. I, I think one thing we always hear from our summits as feedback is that folks feel welcome. They feel embraced, you know, yeah. and that's so that's important. That's part of our asset brand is, is like we want to make sure that yeah. you feel yeah. whether you identify as Hispanic, Latino, Latine, Latinx or not. <laughs> you want to be there. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. But well. Well, I hope to be there. Yeah, sounds so exciting. Okay. So definitely would love to attend that. Um, Patricia, I want to thank you so much thank for joining you us for today. I love me. your energy and and the message is is clear and and is very important. And I think you know, Asse doing this work is, in this city is really cool. Absolutely, thank you. Join us for weekly cafecito chats, cafecito yeah. con Asse on our LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. I think I'm missing one, but Instagram. Perhaps. Maybe. <laughs> or Twitter. <laughs> Maybe. I, we'll put everywhere okay, you can find it out you. there. You can make sure to go to aceonline.org. That's yes. H-A-C-E online.org to find out more information about them and to learn more about Patricia and her team and what they're doing here. Um, leading a team that is, uh, if they're like a tenth of your energy and, and vibe, they're amazing. So thank you again for thank joining you. us. Yeah. It. Yeah. And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of the Bridging Chicago podcast. Um, again, you can go to asayonline.org to find out more information about Asay, um, the organization, but you can also go to www.bridgingchicago.com to learn more about them, to listen to this episode again or any past episodes including our prior five seasons now in season six, which is really That's exciting. Um, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter where our handle is at Bridging Chicago. Or, of course, you can find us on LinkedIn by searching Bridging Chicago. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bridging Chicago as produced by the SATC Solutions Center. Nothing contained in this podcast shall constitute financial, investment, legal, and or professional advice. No professional relationship of any kind is created between you and the podcast host or guest. You are urged to speak with your financial, investment, or legal advisors before making any investment or legal decisions. Furthermore, the opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the opinions of SATC Solution Center, SATC Law, or any of its employees. This podcast is created by the hosts and guests' individual capacities. All opinions on this podcast are or have been rendered based on specific facts under certain conditions and are subject to certain assumptions and may not and should not be used or relied upon for any other purpose, including, but not limited to, or use in or in connection with any investment purposes or legal proceeding. 